buddy, wife, and I, we've been talking about kids, and we've decided that we're not ready, which is a big problem because we have one, and <laughs> we're about to have a second one. Like expectant parents will go, you, does it feel different? Does it feel like no love you've ever known before? And you go, yeah, yeah, it does. Uh, but it changes other things about you as well. Big, weird things, like the way you watch a Madeleine McCann documentary. <laughs> Like, before I had kids, I watched this Madeleine McCann documentary, and they were saying that the parents of Madeleine McCann uh, drugged their children so they could go out dancing, and they accidentally overdosed Madeleine, killing her, and then they hid the body and lied about it for over a decade. And I watched it, and I thought, there's absolutely no way. That, that seems ridiculous. And now I have a child, I watch that, and I think, oh, no, they killed that little girl, 100%. <laughs> She's dead, they did it. There's no doubt. There's zero doubt in my mind. And what's more, I don't even think they need to go to prison, frankly. They made a mistake. It was bad. It was bad. All right? But of the three children they drugged, two survived. That's a 66%. That's a pass grade where I went to school. You know what? That, it is better to have loved and lost than to have never murdered a child to begin with. I reckon cricket was invented for the sole purpose of annoying people who didn't care about cricket. <laughs> You're there watching the cricket and someone walks in. Who's winning? No. <laughs> <laughs> my tail light's been out for some time and it has only changed one part of my driving. Uh, is how I drive when there is a policeman directly behind me. <laughs> the rule is no touching the brake pedal. <laughs> so if I'm coming up to a red light or someone who's stopped abruptly, violently shift into third gear, violently shift into second gear, risk first gear for a minute or two, rolling handbrake. And I thought that was a really good idea to hide my brake light. What I now realise is the policeman is seeing a car come to a stop with neither brake light go off. It probably looks twice as bad. <laughs> Christmas time. Christmas time is here again. Are you looking forward to Christmas? Have you got the real tree? Don't have a tree. <laughs> I'd spit on you if I was allowed to under the COVID-19 regulations. <laughs> One must have a real tree. I have a real tree for the first time in my entire life this year. I thought it would be romantic. You'd go out to the field, and you'd cut down the tree, and you'd drag it back. Actually, they give you a saw, not an axe. And you have to lie on the ground because the branches go very low. And with long grass and brown snakes everywhere. And ah! you measure it out and you try and cut high enough up and leave a big stump so that you save $10 on the length. <laughs> and I got the tree, I popped it in the back of the ute, drove home, and on the, before the tree was even up, for the first time, I knew I was better than other people. I stopped into the Kmart... and I saw... I was buying electric lights and I saw someone else buying electric lights and a plastic tree. And I went, oh, no, put that back. Oh, you must have a real tree. And the smell of the real tree. And I, you know, all these wonderful things. But then this lady came over to my fucking house and she saw my real tree and she was impressed. She was like, hey, you got a real tree? I was like, yes. And she said, but you've got electric lights. I said, the only kind? She said, absolutely not. You must have the candle. This is what people do. They take real candles and they tie them to a tree that has been drying for a month. <laughs> the entirety of Advent. It's showy kindling by that point, littered with live flame. And I thought, oh, that, that, that sounds beautiful. <laughs> but I just, I can't die that way. <laughs> because when I die, I need people to feel sorry for me. I can't have people come to my funeral and say, was it necessary to have quite such a flamboyant suicide? <laughs> and if my wife survives, you know, she'll go off to the life insurance broker 
and she'll look through the... Oh, I'm sorry, Mrs. McCann, but there's nothing in your husband's life insurance policy that protects against being a massive spaz! <laughs> You're not married, are you? But I went to your brother's wedding, yeah. and it was quite beautiful, but I have some complaints. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, my wedding ceremony with my wife was quite traditional. And I, I don't just mean, like, she wore white, and, and there was organ music. I mean, it mostly involved an old priest uh, whispering Latin. <laughs> so, I understand that I also had a polarising wedding before I... <laughs> I go on, but the weddings today, I don't blame the people getting married, I blame the celebrants. These people are agents of the devil, and they, they are just real scumbag type individuals. They encourage people to write their own vows. I can't tell you enough to not write your own vow. Please. The old vows are sensational. Sickness, health, wealth, poverty. Please don't have sex with anyone. We're out. That's the big five. They're difficult, they're aspirational, but you can achieve them! Now people have funny <laughs> vows. They stand there and they go, oh, I, I vow always to pick my socks up off the ground. <laughs> and I vow always to go travelling with you. <laughs> and you sit there thinking, well, fuck the COVID-19 thing. is just rat like, it's, what happens if you can't travel? Is your relationship over? <laughs> You've shattered the vow, it's grounds for divorce. What do you fucking walk in on your wife having sex with three members of your family? And you go, what are you doing? Oh, it takes your cousin out of her mouth and go, oh, I'm sorry, love, you left your socks on the ground. You left your socks on the ground. We are even Stevens. And the aspirational ones I find even more troubling. The ones that are too strict. Like, okay, your brother, now, I, see, I went to another wedding, I saw your brother there, and I said, I want to do this joke about one of the vows that you did that I found troubling. And he said, all right, but use my name. I want to shout out. So Nick Thompson and his, and his Miss OG train. And they said to each other something that sounds beautiful for people who have not been married before. They said, I vow to find something new to love about you every single day. I mean, good f***ing luck with that. It's just, they're going to be very, very small things by the second week. <laughs> How about I vow not to open up your head with a machete? Something that will be hard, but achievable. It's a beautiful room. It's a beautiful space to perform in. I'm sad to say this is the last time I will be doing comedy here. What? Yep. I'll finish. Uh, before my circumcision... It's medical. I guarantee it's medical. It's so medical you wouldn't believe it. I, uh, I won't go in. Again, not too much detail, but if you've ever accidentally tied a knot in track pants when it's too tight. <laughs> too dark, too weird, too much about my penis. <laughs> when I realised it was happening, because it just got worse over time, and I thought, oh, I've, I've, I've done this to myself, haven't I? That was the only thought I could have, is I don't know what I've done, but it's crook. Because I don't believe in lubricant. Morally, I don't believe in... You know, some men, some men, they go, I've got my lotion, I've got my special silk T-shirt to ejaculate into, I've got my special masturbating glove. No, I, I'm repulsed by masturbating. I don't think people should do it. And I think every time I masturbate, I've lost a battle with Satan. And frankly, the thought that Satan would possess me for long enough to take a trip down to Chemist Warehouse and buy a big tub of Mr. Locomotion's finest, I just, I refuse to believe it. And so I thought, well, I've brought this on myself. Frankly, I thought my penis would have started looking bad sooner. I got away with it for a long time. For a while there, I'd thought that maybe there was a portrait of my penis in an attic somewhere growing old while mine remained youthful. It's the penis of Dorian Gray. But, <laughs> but I went to the doctor and he said, you've developed scar tissue there and we don't know why it happens. Sometimes through life, you just develop scar tissue there. It's totally unknown. So I was like, okay, maybe it's not choking the chickens coming home to roost. Maybe 
That's one of my other theories. I have two other theories. So one is self-harm from a misspent youth. <laughs> two is I have a congenital foreskin issue that no one in my family has ever picked up because son to father, we've been circumcised all the way back to the reign of Queen Victoria. <laughs> I've got the oldest, most haggard foreskin. <laughs> and the third theory <laughs> is that God has chosen me to form a new covenant. Which is possible. And so I went to the doctor and he looked at it. He was very calm. He's like, well, that'll have to be, that'll have to be coming off. And um, if you'd come in sooner, we could have saved your foreskin. Which is so sad. You know, this is men. We always delay going to the doctor until the last possible minute. This is why women have so few circumcisions. <laughs> it would be fine. Apparently scar tissue just develops in other parts of the body all the time. It just pops up and you don't touch it and it goes away, but you can't do that with the foreskin. It's always moving and changing and doing something new. It's the Lady Gaga of the flesh. <laughs> but I've timed it for the same week that my wife is giving birth. That's when I'm going to have it cut off. So that we will both have our genitals ruined at the same time. Because I'm a gentleman. And it means that we can heal together. And abstain lovingly from one another. And then, probably through the flames of desire, a little too early for both of us, when we come together again, it will be as though two virgin lesbians are penetrating each other for the first time. <laughs>